Hello, Hi Rock. Welcome to our daily devotional. We're continuing with our walk through the Gospel of Luke, and we're finishing up today the story of Jesus encountering two disciples on the road to Emmaus. So we're in Luke chapter 20, 24, verses 28 through 35, where we read the following. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, um, I have always heard this passage referred to uh, with the summary of Jesus being revealed in the, the breaking of bread. And it's a passage that I know many people have turned to to point to the, the centrality of communion and some of the the meaning that we might uh, plumb from its practice. Uh, you know, in in Christian circles, uh, sadly, communion has been a subject of tremendous debate over the many years, especially in uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, there was a debate about whether whether Jesus was truly present in the bread, whether the bread truly became the body and the blood and the wine became the blood of Jesus. So many debates about kind of the metaphysical uh, aspects of this, which I think were ultimately unanswerable in any way, like why people thought they could uh, come to a conclusion on those things. And then there's a question of like, you know, to what degree does this, well, let me say that I think the one question that, that really was valid was saying, was to ask, to what degree does this sign participate in the reality that it represents? And, and I, I use that word sign intentionally because there's a difference between a symbol and a sign, right? Like you can have a symbol, like a paragraph symbol that doesn't represent a paragraph in any real way. It just looks, it just looks a certain way so that we can recognize, oh, this means paragraph. But there's there certain signs that in a way stand in the place of the thing they represent. Like for instance, if if someone, I don't know, like steps on an American flag and, and burns it, like, are they just burning a symbol? I think there's something more going on where we feel uh, really emotionally attached to that. And we feel like a person who's doing that is like stepping on America. Or maybe another example would be, you know, our uh, a wedding ring. Like if I take my wedding ring off, that means something more than just the symbol of it. If I step on it or throw it away or, or throw it into the woods, I, I really am discarding my marriage in a real sense. There's a way in which that sign participates in the reality that it represents. And I would say that I can certainly sign on to that aspect of communion without trying to answer all the metaphysical questions that depend on kind of philosophical worldviews that may not even be valid or even something that we would hold to anymore. Uh, I, I remember uh, when I was a young adult and um, I was going through, I was leading a, um, a young adults group and there was kind of a crisis of leadership as this one person left. She got engaged and wanted to focus on that. And so she pulled out. And, and so we, uh, I started having these meetings on Sunday night where we would go through all the leadership tasks. But then we had this time afterwards where people could choose to stay. And we had like this half hour buffer so people could naturally, you know, uh, work their way out. But then for those of uh, those people who chose to stay, we'd have this communion time where we would take bread and we would take wine and we would, first of all, share how God had been present to us that week. It could be in a scripture. It could be in a moment of prayer. It could be, it was really undefined. Just how was God present to you? So we were really celebrating the real presence of Jesus in our lives. And then we would take communion together. And this is like a Protestant uh, kind of Baptist adjacent church where there was theologically, there was no belief in a real presence of Christ in, in, in the communion elements. And yet when we celebrated communion on those nights, you would see these <laughs> you know, Protestant young adults treating these elements with terrific reverence as if it really was somehow Jesus present in those elements, in this breaking of bread and the sharing of wine. 
And at the end of the year, when we did leadership evaluations and we, we looked at what had happened, it was surprising the number of people who said that this communion celebration was literally the most important thing we had done as a group the entire year. And there were three people who said it was the most important spiritual experience in their lives up to that point. And so this was something that really drove home to me that, you know, beyond the philosophical and theological questions, it really drove home to me the way that Jesus, you know, as the word is present in the scriptures, but also present in the practice of remembering uh, Jesus together, especially in the breaking of bread. Dave, I'm wondering what you see in this passage and in, in, in the celebration of communion itself. Well, you know, you've taken this pretty deep, but I'm going to just be a little bit, I don't know, maybe more superficial. Um, yeah, just because I actually think kind of some of the stuff here is really right on the surface, uh, or, or you know, maybe it's it's very plain um, to me. And so, right, first, let me connect it to what we talked about yesterday, where we said how the the two disciples that were walking the road to Maus were probably Cleopas. We know it was Cleopas because they mentioned him, uh, but the other person was most likely his wife, who we know was at the resurrection or was at the uh, the crucifixion. Um, so they're walking back. And they, they get as far back as Emmaus, and the reason they stopped there is that that's where they live, right? And so it just makes the point. They were done. They were going home. They had given up. And I just want you to hold on to this, because a lot of us have people who are close to us, and maybe it's you, uh, you know, people who are close to us who are, you know, in the middle of some kind of deconstructing and just not sure about their faith, and, you know, they, they just seem to be walking away. And, well, literally. Cleopas and his wife, who were as close as anybody ever could be to, to the, the whole, you know, kind of insider information, uh, they they were walking, they were going home. They had turned their back on it. Nothing was making sense anymore, and they were going home. Uh, and, and so then they meet this fellow. We talked about this yesterday. They meet this guy along the road who just starts explaining from the scriptures everything, how all the scriptures point to, to who Jesus was and why he had to die. Because that was a part that just threw people out, made no sense. And I think a lot of us have things like that, where we look at, at some huge disappointment. We just go, I, it doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow that? Why would God do that? That's just, ah, it doesn't make any sense. And, and we start to then, we lose our trust in God because things aren't working the way that we expected. And, you know, it's easy to point fingers and say, well, gosh, come on. You should have a more rigorous, resilient faith, that, faith than that. But Cleopas and his own wife, they didn't have a more resilient faith than that, uh, right? They, they, were, they were rocked by all of this. And sometimes we're rocked by all of this. But then they met this stranger on the road, explains everything, it all points to Jesus. And they were just like mesmerized, right? And, and it, it was by hearing the scriptures and, and starting to just understand what God was doing and to start... I think in the midst of that, see God's care, how many little pieces God had laid out, how all the different kind of elements of this apparently disparate history were all converging. They could just start to see God's care. And there's just something in them like, wow, this, this is not your typical conversation. So they urged Jesus to stay the night, you know, just stay, stay at their home. And as they're sitting down to eat, and so this is what I think, I, I suspect is a lot more plain than some of the, the more metaphysical stuff you were talking about. They sat down to eat, and he took the bread, which is normally what the host would do, right? Normally, the, the, it should be, in the tradition, it should be Cleopas who does this. And yet Jesus takes the bread and blesses it because he is the host. Then he broke it and he gave it to them, just like it happened at the Last Supper. You know, all these people have been chatting, right? Ever since the Last Supper, they'd all been because neither Cleopas nor Mary were there, but but they'd all heard about all you know, all the details for sure in that kind of the, the next day or two as they're with all the other disciples. And suddenly Jesus does the very thing that he'd done as he invited his friends to this last supper. And he said, As I have loved you. So you must love one another, right? As, as Jesus kind of just showed who he really was in that supper, now Jesus breaks the bread and he gives it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And as we've talked before, Jesus clearly had some kind of resurrection body that was 
well, they were able to recognize him once they had the eyes to see it, but they didn't recognize him right away, right? There was something also a little bit different. And I think a lot of us have had this experience. I had this experience when, you know, we went through the, the pandemic and we didn't see people for a couple of years. And some of these children that I had known since they, before they were born, all right, I, 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 I married some of their parents and I'd watched these kids grow up. I knew them so well. I'd seen them constantly, right? And, and then I didn't see them for a couple of years. And, you know, kids go through puberty. They, they just look different, right? Their facial structure, everything changes. They grow like weeds. And I just, I didn't recognize them. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, hold it. I know who that is. And once I could see it, well, then I could see it. Uh, and I, I have a feeling it's like that. It's that Jesus was enough similar and enough different. And, and so all of a sudden, oh, my gracious, I know who this is. This is Jesus. Right. And as soon as they realized who it was, as soon as they realized he was actually there, he disappeared. Anyway, I, I, I suspect that's what was going on. They just, it was a reenactment of this Last Supper. And they want something, how did we miss this right in front of us? Um, then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the way back? And, and we said, Many of us have had that experience where it seems like on the outside, we're just having a conversation, but something is just, whoa, it's overwhelming because the spirit is at work in us. And so it did not hurt to burn with us. He talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. And within the hour, now they had walked all day, seven miles, right? I mean, I'm not saying that's like, you know, it's not a marathon, but it's not, it's like a real walk. Uh, and so they'd walked for seven miles. It's dinner time, dark dangerous and what do they want to do it <laughs> we're going back to jerusalem this is too good to keep to ourselves and so they, they went on back and by the time they finally got there and found the other uh disciples they said uh the lord really is risen he appeared to peter and now jesus has started to do this all these different people having these encounters in fact paul says he appeared to 500 people at once and paul makes a list later on of, of all these various people that jesus had had, had appear, uh, appeared to. And part of the reason why this is actually important is that these people, many of them were still alive at the time of the writing of the gospels. And so basically what the gospel writers are saying is, hey, all these people saw, and these aren't just like, you know, fairy tale kind of once upon a time in a land far, far away. No, no, no. This is, this is Cleopas and, and his wife, Mary. Yeah, you know, you know them. Go talk to them. Go get the story from them. And the idea was, we've got nothing to hide. We want to give you all this information. And I think this then can be, and you described this beautifully uh, with your story, but this, I think, can make communion so beautiful. Communion is lining up to get a cracker and some wine. You can do better. If, if communion is an opportunity to see who Jesus really is, to remember his sacrifice, for us to to be that community that has that encounter with the living Christ then as you say it's going to be the most important thing we do each week i i love communion that's why we do it every week at high rock i just feel like it's it is it's one of the most important things we do hmm. uh, lovely insights wonderful and i there's one thing i just want to highlight for people we're not going to talk much about it right now just this fact that peter that jesus revealed himself to peter uh, alone. Uh, there's this kind of uh, meeting and, and restoration before Peter gets publicly restored with the other disciples. In, in any case, uh, I, if you're willing, uh, if you have any more insights, please, but otherwise I'm going to close this in prayer. No, please close this in prayer. I've talked too long. <laughs> Our good and gracious God, we thank you for the many ways that Jesus is present to us. We especially today celebrate the way that Jesus is revealed in the breaking of bread uh, in this re remembrance of all that Jesus has done and said and taught us and in the way he has promised uh, to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to opening the scriptures with you again tomorrow as we discover more and more about our Savior and about ourselves. <laughs>